Okay, hi everybody. We are glad that you are here. We know that there's no school tomorrow. There was no school. I know, that's right. If there's nothing else to be thankful for, there's no school tomorrow. Um, but we are glad that you are here tonight. Uh, I do apologize a little bit for not having a Friendsgiving here tonight. Pie and turkey and ham and stuffing. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, you can have all that stuff tomorrow, okay? Um, uh, we are going to be looking at, now we're, go, we're going to do some jumping around tonight, okay? So you'll need to be ready to like get those Bibles open and start flipping. However, the main part of our time tonight is going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And uh, so we will we'll look at that, we'll read it. And then we'll jump around a little bit, and we'll come back to it. Uh, but there are, in, in, this, um, in this verse, there are two main divisions. You know, I always give main divisions for those of you that take notes, that want to take notes. There'll be lots of note-taking tonight if you're a note-taker. Uh, but there are two main d uh, divisions that we'll see in this verse, and there is the message in the first part of it, and then the motivation in the second part of it. So the message... And then the motivation. Thanksgiving, obviously, I know that you all know very well that Thanksgiving is under attack. That the Thanksgiving holiday is under attack. Uh, there is a, a certain segment of society that is telling us that uh, it is bad, that it's evil, uh, that we ought to uh, do away with Thanksgiving, and uh, that we should... Uh, uh, not celebrate the coming of Columbus or the, the coming of the, the pilgrims or uh, the settlers, the people that came in to the so-called New World at the time, uh, what, what is now known as the United States. Uh, we know that all of that is under attack and, um, and uh, that we should rather celebrate the, the native people that were here. And I, I want to share something with you as we start out. I, I, what I do not want to do is... Um, I don't want to go full on into politics uh, because politics is not the answer, right? Jesus is. So we want to make sure that we are focusing on God and his word. But I do want to share something with you because I want you to understand that tomorrow, Thanksgiving, is not an evil thing. Now, we are going to, uh, we're going to, to uh, 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 evolve into Thanksgiving as a whole, but I want to read something to you that I don't know if I don't know how many of you have you ever uh, have ever read this. This is this is the first official um, federal recon recognizing um, of of Thanksgiving. This was a proclamation that was given by George Washington. Anybody know who that is? Anybody? Yeah. Who was he? Who was he? First president of. The United States of America, right? Okay. And so have, have, have any of you ever read his Thanksgiving proclamation? Anybody? Okay, this is fantastic. First time. First time. Here's what, here's what uh, George Washington, President Washington wrote. It's a little bit long, but let me, let me breeze through it real quickly. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor, and whereas both house, uh, houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend the peop to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity, peaceably, to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now therefore, George Washington says, I, now therefore I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, okay, he was writing this in October, I believe, to be devoted by the people of these states, to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. 
that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for, and he's going to mention six things that the nation should be thankful for. Number one, his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation. Number two, for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war. Speaking of the, uh, the, the, uh, the war that had recently taken place, obviously. Uh, number three, for the great degree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed. Number four, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government for our safety and happiness, and particularly the national one now lately instituted. Number five, for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed and the means we have of acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge. And in general, number six, for all the great and various favors which he, speaking of God, of course, has been pleased to confer upon us. And also, this is, I like this part, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications. What he just did was, he just said, we're going to have a national day of thanksgiving. And then he said, right now, he said, also, we're going to be thanking God, but we're just going to go ahead and ask him for some more things. I like that. A friend of mine told me years ago, a Christian guy, told me, listen, we don't deserve anything, so we might as well just ask for everything. That's what George Washington does here. He says, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions to enable us all, whether in public or private stations, to perform our several and relative duties properly and punctually, to render our national government a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws, discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed, to protect and guide all sovereigns and nations, especially such as have shown kindness to us, and to bless them with good governments, peace, and concord, to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue and the increase of science among them and us, and generally to grant unto all mankind such a degree of temporal prosperity as he alone knows to, knows to be best. Given under my hand at the city of New York, the third day of October in the year of our Lord, 1789, George Washington. Now, in case you didn't know, again, that was, that was the first uh, uh, official Thanksgiving uh, government uh, proclamation, okay? Uh, however, what we celebrate today, though uh, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, you need to understand that, that celebrating it on tomorrow, uh, that that all came about in uh, 1863, Abraham Lincoln had encouraged Americans to recognize the last Thursday of November as a day of Thanksgiving. Uh, however, it wasn't until 1870, 1870, when Congress passed legislation making Thanksgiving, along with Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and Independence Day, national holidays. Now, why in the world would I read that? If we're having a Bible study, why would I read that? Well, here's why. Because Thanksgiving is under attack. Uh, Tis the season to see uh, some of your favorite celebrities on their social media so boldly uh, just uh, denouncing Thanksgiving as, uh, as the commemoration of murder and disease with the coming of Christopher Columbus and the pilgrims, which, by the way, everybody in here knows that Christopher Columbus didn't bring the pilgrims, right? They were like uh, 100 years apart. Okay, so just to, sometimes, sometimes in the in the in the modern day, as somebody's making their argument, hating on all of those people, they seem to like clump them all together, and you get this idea that that Christopher Columbus was cruising up in his ship, and it was full of pilgrims. That was not the case. Uh, by the time the pilgrims got here, uh, people had been here for over a hundred years already. There were settlements, and uh, things were were underway. Why do I read those for you, though? Here's why. 
Here's why. Here's why I read the address of George Washington, the first president of the United States. Because he was, as far as Thanksgivings are concerned, okay, and uh, many of us are under the assumption that we celebrate Thanksgiving because of the pilgrims. And then, and then we start to talk about pilgrims and the, the natives that were here and all the trouble they had and there was murder and there was disease and there was all these things taking place. But did you hear George Washington ever once mention Christopher Columbus or the pilgrims? He never did. It is a, it's a farce that tomorrow what we're doing is celebrating the coming of Christopher Columbus or we're also not celebrating the coming of the pilgrims. That's not what tomorrow is all about. Tomorrow is called what? Thanksgiving. And George Washington, the first president, and if you want to know more, some of you want to know more about those things, wallbuilders.com. Excellent source, and I'll tell you why Wall Builders is an excellent source. Wallbuilders.com is an excellent source because they've got articles and links and all sorts of resources. However, Wall Builders also owns, I don't know what the number is now, it's grown, but they actually own actual documents, historical government documents from so many of these things uh, uh, having to do with Thanksgiving. Uh, they own documents of uh, some of the governors from back then that were uh, giving out Thanksgiving proclamations. I'm reading all of this because I want you to understand that we can lose sight very quickly if we think that tomorrow is only about the coming of Columbus or the, the coming of the pilgrims. That's, that's actually not what the day is to be focused or centered on. Can we remember those things and and uh, think about them, and oh yeah, they had a Thanksgiving, or they, yeah, sure, but tomorrow is Thanksgiving, meaning this, that tomorrow is a day, this is going to sound so elementary, but it's important for you to understand this, that tomorrow is a day for giving thanks, and it's a day for giving thanks to God. That's got to be the main focus. That's got to be the main focus. Because that's what it was all about. That's what George Washington and so many other presidents and governors and other people throughout history have wanted it to be about. That's what George Washington was telling us. There should be a day set apart to thank God. That's it. So why is Thanksgiving under attack? Thanksgiving is under attack because it's a day of giving thanks to God. And does Satan want that to happen? Absolutely not. He hates that. He doesn't want anybody acknowledging God. What he'd rather do is get people all stirred up, fired up, online keyboard warriors, you know, to argue about the pilgrims and Christopher Columbus and the natives and all these And there was rats and there was diseases and there was all these things and there was fighting. That's what he wants us to get all wrapped up in. You and I being Christians, filled with God's spirit, filled with wisdom, we don't get all wrapped up in that because what that does is, what that does is it takes glory and attention away from God. No, you and I, we focus on what the day is all about. It's a national day of thanking God. There, there is something, as I was reading through several of these documents, I noticed something that a lot of these leaders that were giving out these Thanksgiving Day proclamations, they were, they were telling the nation, hey, you need to thank, you need to use the day to be in church and to thank God publicly. And I've noticed that we've drifted away from that. You know what I mean? It's like, we're not in church tomorrow. Why? Because it's a family holiday. It's good to have family, but it's actually not a family holiday. It's a holiday to recognize and honor and remember and thank God. That's what it's for. Okay? Now, I'll be... Uh, sitting on my couch just so happy tomorrow uh, watching World Cup games and waiting for you know my servants in the kitchen to finish my turkey and uh, you know my stuffing uh, please don't don't tell my family I called them servants uh, but they'll you know they'll be in there and, 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 I'll, and I'll just be so excited enjoying the day and I won't be at church that is the truth and, and I'll and I'll still be very joyful but the idea was to spend the day in church with your church family praising God thanking him for all that he had given Okay, now what we want to do is for the next several minutes, and we're going to be going through this quickly, so you're going to need to follow along. 
is we're going to be looking at this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Let's go ahead and read it. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, this, as we start out, you need to understand this, that thanksgiving, the holiday is under attack because, because being thankful is under attack. The people that we are hearing on our social media feeds, the people, the, the, uh, the, the politicians or the celebrities or the uh, college professors, all of these people that are complaining are people that are not thankful. And they're not thankful because in their minds they think that they deserve something more. And so they, they're not thankful. And so because they're not thankful, the thought of spending a day being thankful angers them. But we, you and I, must remember that it is Satan that is behind this. He doesn't want anybody being thankful to God. So you and I tonight are going to take a few minutes to remember that, oh, that's right, we're supposed to give thanks. Now, this is difficult here, verse, verse uh, 18, verse Thessalonians 5, 18, because what does he say? He says, in everything, give thanks. In everything? That's tough. That's a tough thing to do. That's a tough thing to do. When, when you really wanted to go to the mall to get that new pair of shoes for Hoko, and Dad's like, Nah, you ain't doing that. We're not spending money on those. It's really hard to be thankful in that, in that instance. Really hard to be thankful. But that is exactly what Paul, God's word, that's exactly what Paul is telling us to do, is to be in everything, give thanks. Now, the question is this. The question is, how can I learn to live a life, a, a life of giving thanks or learn how to be, learn how to live, a, 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 or learn how to, a, a, what, a, what a thanks living life is like. How, how do I develop that? Well, there's lots of different things, and, and I'm summing it up and making it easy because we, just, we don't have that much time. So I'm going to give you a few basic ways that you and I can learn to have a thankful attitude, to be thankful in all things, in everything to be thankful, to give thanks. Okay? Now, Number one, number one, here's the message. The message is this. I was given life. Now, I told you we're going to flip through. Those of you that are quick and you want to flip through with us, that's a great idea because I would recommend you having your Bible and marking some of these verses. If you're, if you're the, the type that likes to write in your Bible, which I think is a good idea, you might want to mark these verses. So I'm going to take you there. I, I was about to put them up. I was going to put them up on the screen, and then I thought, no, it'd be better that way. They see them themselves, and maybe they mark them. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. If you want to turn there, or maybe you just want to write it down and look at it later. But Psalm 139 is a wonderful chapter, it's a wonderful psalm, and many of us are familiar with it. I want to show you something. We were given life, and I'll make a point in just a moment, but let me read Psalm 139, beginning at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, you, this is David speaking to God, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Verses 5 through 12. Now David, as he's writing this, kind of looks at this, looks at life backward. And what he starts with is the fact that we are sustained, that our life is sustained. We were given life, and that life is sustained by God. David wrote in another psalm, I lay down, I slept, I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. The point that I'm making here is the life that we have is sustained by God. You do not sustain your own life. 
Now, there is, you do do some sustaining of your own life, but when you lay down at night and you say your prayers, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep it, if I should have it before I wake, pray the Lord my soul today. You don't say, also, heart, would you just continue beating? And lungs, would you just continue inhaling and exhaling so that I don't choke and die in the middle of the night? <laughs> you don't do that. You lay down, you go to sleep, you're not worried about, you might be worried about things, but you're not worried about your body stopping. You take it for granted. We take it for granted, right? We just take it for granted. We just, we lay down. We wake up in the morning because God sustains the life that God sustains the life that he has given us. David talks about that beginning in verse 13. So he sustains us, but he's also supplied us with life. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. He goes on down to verse 18 to explain to us, to show us that the life that we have was supplied to us. What's the point? Life was supplied and that life continues to be sustained by God. My point is this, in, in, in trying to develop uh, the, the attitude of being thankful, you and I need to remember that we didn't birth ourselves. I know it sounds like that's really dumb and that's obvious, I know, but some people do not seem to understand that. You may not believe in God. So in that case, you would say, well, no, I didn't birth myself, so my parents gave me life, you might say. Now, those of us that are Christians, which would be the majority of us, maybe all of us, we all understand, yeah, our parents gave us birth, but that's because God created us. The point that I'm making here is in, 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 in developing a, a mindset, a life of giving thanks, we first must understand that we've been given life. We didn't give ourselves life. We've been given life. Our life depends on someone or something else. Now, again, those of us that are Christians, we understand our lives depend on God, not something. But even if I were an atheist, I still would have to admit that my life depends on someone or something outside of me because I don't know my blood just keeps flowing and my heart is beating and my lungs are breathing and I don't know I I didn't do it that's the point is I, I'm not sustaining my own life so so I realized that you know what my, my there's something bigger going on here that that there's something there's something bigger outside of me that is giving me life and sustaining that life but secondly secondly I was, in, 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 in attempting to develop this thankful attitude, uh, we need to understand that I was given spiritual life. In Ephesians chapter 2, I told you we'd be flipping around. You could flip to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll read through this uh, quickly as you're turning there. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin." So we're told there in verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that we were spiritually dead. He says you were dead in trespasses and sins. And he tells us why. In verse 2, we were living according to Satan's plan. We were living according to Satan. I'm not saying that you were a Satanist. That's not what I'm accusing you of. But he goes on to explain there in verse 2 that you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's in reference to Satan. But we were also dead spiritually because of the self, because of Satan and because of self, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 2, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Even if you got saved at a very young age, you were a child of wrath prior to getting saved, right? 
What was the first thing you did when you were born? You cried, little brat, right? The doctor uh, extracted you. Your mom pushed, and the doctor was there to, to catch you. And uh, the doctor may have, you know, gave you a spank on the hind quarter in order to shake you up, wake you up, and the first thing you started to do was cry. Why? Because you're not inside your warm, you know, uh, uh, room anymore. You're not inside your mom's body anymore. Now you're out, and there's these bright lights, and it's cold in here, and there's some strange man touching me, and there's nurses, and there's people wanting to cut umbilical. What are the, what's going on? And, and so, so e even from our youngest ages, it's clear that we were selfish. <laughs> And as we continue to grow, we just continue to be selfish. But God saved us from all of that. He gave us spiritual life. In Ephesians chapter 2, he goes on in verses 4 through 7. First he said in verses 1 through 3 that we were spiritually dead. But then he explains in verses 4 through 7 that we were saved. Verses 4 and 5 says that we were resurrected from the dead. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. We were resurrected. And then not only that, we were raised up. In verses 6 and 7, raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the point is, when I'm trying to develop this, this attitude, this life of giving thanks, of being thankful to God, I want to remember that my life actually depends on someone else. I was given life. Not only that, the spiritual life that I have also depends on someone else because I was dead. I was saved by God through Jesus. My salvation depends on someone else. It's not me. I can be thankful that I have life. I can be thankful that I have spiritual life. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, we find out the next one. I am given all I need in life. Philippians 4.19, Paul wrote, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, this is an easy one to, uh, for me to, to, um, to bring up in a room full of high school students. We were given, uh, or I'm, I am given, I'm supplied with, I'm given all I need in life. That goes spiritually and physically. When Paul said in Philippians 4.19 that God would supply all that we needed according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, he meant all that we needed, both physically and spiritually. But this is an easy one, because the majority of you in here do not have jobs. And yet I look around the room, you all are dressed pretty nice. Got your hoodies on, got some long sleeve shirts. You got your uh, you got your J's on, or your Nikes, or your Vans, or whatever. You're all it looks like you're all very well taken care of, and you may be a very sweet young man or young woman, and maybe you deserved those things. But the fact is, for the majority of us in here, you couldn't afford it, so somebody else provided for you. So, so not only in developing this life of thanksgiving, this attitude of thanksgiving, do I need to remember that, uh, that I'm given all I need in life, both spiritually and physically. And, and that's from God, that God provides all that I need spiritually and even physically. You go, well, my mom and my dad, they're the ones that, they work and they brought the check and they bought me these Nikes. However, God provided the jobs for them and the ability to be able to do those jobs. See, see God is... He's at the center of it all. He's the one in charge. He's the one leading it. So, so I need to be thankful because, man, all I'm given, you know, all I'm given for, you know, for life, um, all that I have has really been given to me. Even, even if you, as you get older and you're 30 and thriving and you're successful and you've finished college and you're making your own money and you are an independent young woman or you are you know, a, 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 a boss woman or a boss man or whatever, and you're, and you're, you're, you know, you're making it on your own. Listen, the ability that you have to think and to, and to work, those come from God. We already determined that I, we don't do that ourselves. The life that I have has been supplied to me, but it's also sustained. 
as I look around, all of you in a few minutes are going to get up and walk out of here. Because you have the ability to do so. You have the ability to stand up. You have the ability to walk. Your body functions properly because God has supplied and sustained you. So I'm given all that I need in life. And there's a, there's a last one here in this section on the message, and that is that this, that God is sovereign. How can I be thankful when my mom uh, is diagnosed with cancer? How can I be thankful when dad lost his job? How can I be thankful when my pet, my dog, died? How can I be thankful when this uh, tragedy happened in my life? How can I be thankful? Well, here's why. Because in Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28, that's another one that you should mark, that you should memorize. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It is important that when I am trying to develop a mindset, a lifestyle of giving thanks, to remember that I can be thankful in everything. Remember you said in everything give thanks? Why? Well, because this life was given to me. My spiritual life was given to me. All that I have has been given to me. And God is working out all of these situations and circumstances for my good. Because he's sovereign. That means he's all-powerful, and God is watching over me. And so when tragedies come up and diseases and sicknesses and car wrecks and, uh, the, uh, and, and death in a loved one or in a beloved family pet, whatever it might be, it's some, in some kind of loss, I can still be thankful, understanding that everything, God is working everything out for good. Do I know what the, what, the, what the goal is or what the good is? No, I do not. That is the truth. I don't know. But I can be thankful knowing that God's on the job. Now, there are two more things that we'll look at, two more main divisions. I'm sorry, one more main division, and that is the motivation for all of this. In everything Paul wrote in our verse, remember 1 Thessalonians 5.18? You can go back there, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, if you've turned somewhere else. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 we're on the home stretch here. Gives us the motivation. First, we have the message in everything, give thanks. But now we have the motivation for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's the motivation. Why should I be thankful? Okay, I understand why, like, my life's been given to me, my life is sustained. Uh, everything that I need for life has been supplied for me. And God is sovereign. He's working all of this out together. But why should I even, why should I even be thankful? I mean, everybody around me is telling me, you know, not to be thankful, that I need to not settle, that I need to, I need to just keep pushing and, and, you know, wait until things are better, wait until things are perfect, I guess. There are people that I, I guess they want things to be perfect before they're going to be thankful. Things are never going to be perfect. Never. Never. Until we get to heaven. But, but what about this motivation? Well, what I find out here is that it is God's will for me. That's what it says in the verse. That's the motivation. This is God's will. Now, this is important. A lot of us, a lot of you, would like to know what God's will is for your life. I know that you have that desire. You want to know what is God's will? What's God's plan? You want to know because you want to serve him. I think you have a genuine desire. Many of you do. Many of you have asked me, like, how, how do I know God's will? Or can you pray for me to know God's will? Many of you have done that. Because you have a desire, a genuine desire, to want to serve God in whatever capacity he's calling you to. But he hasn't revealed that yet, right? So I don't know what God's specific will is for your life. But I can say with, with confidence what God's general will is for your life. Because it tells us here. In everything, give thanks. So be thankful. For this is the will of God in Christ. It's God's will. Now, there's something unique about that. God's will is, when it says God's will, what it means is that it's God's desire, number 
one. It's God's desire. In fact, sorry, I'm getting all excited, preaching like a Baptist and forgetting to put these up here. God's will for me, number one, is God's desire. It's God's desire for me to be thankful, that I would be a thankful person. But secondly, when it says that it's God's will, it doesn't just stop. It's not just God's desire. God's will is also God's decision. For the believer, the Christian, because it is his will for you and I as Christians, it's not just a desire, but it's also a decision that has been made. So that when it says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God, what it means is that you need to be thankful because it's God's desire. However, it's also God's decision, meaning that God is in the process of making you thankful in everything. That's great news because I may not be a thankful person. I may not be a thankful person, but God is in the process of developing that in me because it's his will for me. Wonderful news. And lastly, obviously it says there, God's will for who? In the, in the text it says, it is God's will for you. It's for me. It's for you. If you're a believer, you're a Christian, this is God's will for you that you would be thankful. And tomorrow, thankfully, thankfully, we have a government that hasn't been great in a long time, okay? Long, long time, okay? Long time. However, this imperfect government that we have still recognizes one day out of the year to spend in giving thanks to God. And so we, I mean, we, we, we want to live a life of giving thanks every day as believers. But tomorrow, not only do we get to exercise that, acknowledge God and give thanks, but we also get a whole bunch of food to go along with it. And that's pretty cool. And a day off of school, right? A week off of school. But thankfully, we live in a place that still recognizes this. However, however far the current administration or government or whatever may be from the original idea, you and I understand that tomorrow is not about, oh, Christopher Columbus came here or the pilgrims came here. You know, what, what it's about is giving thanks to God, very simply. So, Father, we thank you so much for tonight and for your word.